Thanks, Alois. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to this webinar. Happy Monday, and we hope that you had a great weekend and just a lot of uh, good stuff happening. So I wanted to tell you that my name is Ray Pan. I am one of the, um, actually, I am the co-convener uh, for the ACRL leadership discussion for this academic year. And I'm just uh, substituting for Alma Ortega, who is at uh, USD. Uh, currently, she'll be resuming her duties uh, in 2018. So we have a really exciting topic today for discussion to share with all of you. And I wanted to, uh, before we uh, introduce the speaker, I wanted to ask all of you if you can just type uh, where you're from. Uh, it would be a good way to, for me and Mary Lee to see uh, where everybody's coming from and get an idea of the geographic differences. Very cool. Hi, Anna. Hi, Janet. Oh, hi, Lisa. Thanks for joining from Houston. Temple University. Hi, Stephen, Allison. Oh, it's a good crowd. Hi, Meredith. Thanks for joining us, Janet. Hi, Tarita. Very cool. Uh, thanks, Garnett, and uh, thanks, Allison, and everyone for sharing where you're coming from. Looks like everyone is all over the place, which is exciting and great. And we really want to um, thank all of you for taking this time to come to this webinar. There's obviously it's a Monday morning, afternoon, or wherever you're coming from, and we want to make sure you um, get the most out of it. So I'm going to introduce the speaker. For those who are not uh, familiar with Mary Lee Kennedy, she's the principal of the Kennedy Group. She partners with organizations to build strong communities that take advantage of the information landscape. She was the Director of Knowledge Networks at Microsoft, Senior Associate Provost at Harvard Libraries, and most recently, Chief Library Officer at the New York Public Library. Uh, thank you, Mary Lee, for agreeing to give this presentation. And if you have any questions, uh, I believe we can take some at the end, um, but if there's some pressing ones you, you want to um, ask, you can ask in the chat and then we'll address it from there. Um, thanks again. Thank you so much, Ray. It's, um, I'm very pleased to, to be here today and I appreciate your invitation to speak with what is really an amazing group of people from across the United States. So um, I think we should have a nice conversation. Um, I'm here to talk to you about a really, really important topic, which is strategy, leadership, and management. And you'll probably note straight out that I crossed off the word visible and replaced it with the word meaningful. This is quite purposeful because while we are all aim for visible, the more meaningful the strategy is, actually the more visible the difference will be. Uh, it's so important that our community, faculty, students, administrators, staff, and peers understand and internalize that the strategy is theirs, one that they connect with, know what it means for them, and one they feel empowered to contribute to achieving. Thank you. So Hi, Mary Lee. Sorry to interrupt. A uh, couple of folks have asked if you can speak louder. Oh, okay. Is that better? Please let me know, is that better? Okay, great, I can see in the chat room. Thank you so much. Um, so this talk is really intended to be reflective for those who are already practicing strategy, leadership, and management regularly, and I hope thought-provoking for those who are new to it. It is based on many years of my own experiences leading organizations through change as well as the work of Rebecca Jones, who co-authored a forthcoming chapter on this topic with me in the Handbook for uh, Modern Information Management. I've talked with lots of colleagues uh, in libraries, companies, nonprofits, and international organizations, and so today I'm hoping to share my knowledge with you. To get started, could, we, could I get a sh show of hands of how many of you are leading or managing a strategy that you put in place recently? Can you just raise your hands? One, okay. Okay, great. Awesome, this is fantastic. 
how about um, those of you who are, are considering how to set a new strategy direction? Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. And how many of you are learning about strategy, leadership and management, but haven't led one yet? Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much, because this will help me think about the best way to present to you. And I hope at any time, um, if you have an urgent question, you'll be prepared and happy to um, raise your hand and ask a question in the chat box. Okay, let's let's get going. So what do we know about the world we live in today? Because strategy is all about context. It's now normal, and I mean, probably I'm stating the obvious, to accept that technological changes are going to change our lives dramatically and are changing our lives dramatically today. We're seeing huge changes and potential uses of innovations that are blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological. I'm sure on your campuses, you're seeing uh, new developments in artificial intelligence, robotics, and augmented reality. The potential they have to create an even greater divide between those who have and do not have awareness, access, and ability to use them is pretty substantial. And they've already raised serious questions about policy, ethical questions, and skills that many of us don't have the answers to yet. And we, as an information professional, as librarians, have a really critical role to play. There's a lot of work to be done to develop 21st century skills, to increase the awareness of the possibilities and the risks of these technologies and what they mean for knowledge curation. Um, there's a lot of work going on about um, digital scholarship and the changes that are happening in our particular fields. And frankly, partnerships are being created all around us. But as always, there are more choices than any one of us can realize individually. So what should the strategic direction be? Well, that's up to you, so many of you, as you're beginning to set directions or leading a new one or thinking about it. But it's hard. It's really hard um, to do strategy well. Um, a strategy does show and demonstrate progress towards a vision, but it's more than that. It's essential to the relevance of an organization. And for some, whole industries. A study by McKinsey of 1,500 organizations found that most of these efforts failed. Uh, this probably is not a surprise for many of you, uh, but what's the cost of that? You could escape. You could think you can escape uh, forming a strategic direction, but you you can't. Either you have a strategy which is led and managed well, or you become part of someone else's strategy, and you may not even know it. Well, not all or even most change efforts are 100% successful, nor last for decades. There is clearly more we can do to increase the chances of success. Today's discussion is intended to help you think about that, what you should keep doing, what you could do differently, or simply start doing to improve the chances of a successful strategy. I'm going to start by sharing an approach that I've used, one that many others have practiced, and reflects lessons learned from a variety of types of institutions. I do hope you will find it useful. First, strategy in this century is very challenging. It's complex. It needs to be contextual. You need to be connected to many different types of relationships. It needs to be organic, which means that it can change it in any part of an ecosystem. It needs to be informing. It needs to be empowering. It needs to be generative, meaning it can renew itself. And most importantly, it needs to deliver value to the intended audience. So 
Let's talk about how we might do that and what, does, what is strategy then under these conditions. Sometimes it's easier to start with identifying what something is not. So let's just put this straight out there, which I'm sure is not news to any of you. The first is, the first is a not point. Strategy is not a plan written on a piece of paper to be reviewed when speaking to key stakeholders. What it is, is a living state. It is, yes, there will be documents, but it is the discipline, art, and science of deciding where to invest in innovation and then getting it done. So it's both. It's a living state. It's organic. It's systemic. It's contextual. Strategy works best when it is internalized, relevant, and actionable every day for every person in the organization. And that's what makes it so hard. That way, the reason that's so important is that everyone's choices drive the strategy forward. If it isn't perceived to be relevant and actionable, which is often the case, it really doesn't deliver its full potential, its value. The strategy then becomes a waste of time. It's okay not to be 100% right. In fact, I would say it's really almost impossible to be 100% right. It's not okay to be wasteful. So how can you and your organizations make a meaningful difference? I'm going to walk you through four key components for strategy, leadership, and management. Each of these is important. You may find you need to think about all of them, or you may find that there is one that is particularly relevant to your situation. So let's start. Value. At the end of the day, the most important thing about a strategy is that it delivers value to its stakeholders. And value is generally defined in two ways. The first way is the regard that something is held to deserve, the importance, worth, or usefulness of something. The other definition of value is a person's principles or standards of behavior, one's judgment of what is important in life. In this context, we're really for focused on the first definition, meaning its importance, its worth, or its usefulness. And by its definition, then, value is almost always subjective, unless we can assign a quantitative metric to it, which is actually an essential part of what we need to do with a strategy. Determining what the value is is the single most important first component in strategy leadership. I have a model I like to use, which I think could be useful to you as well if you aren't yet familiar with it. The focus of this model is on how you can best contribute to the common good for your target audience. The Strategic Triangle for Public Value was developed by Mark Moore. Uh, it was first published in 1995. Mark Moore worked, um, is a faculty member at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And it was initially focused on government's value. Um, since then, though, it has been applied to corporation. It's been used in nationally and internationally with libraries and other types of institution. What's really helpful about this particular model is that it's quite practical. It focuses on the elements that define value for the target groups and the elements that are needed to deliver it. So it's not just what's desirable, but it's actually as well as what's achievable. It helps to take the subjectivity out of value. Each of these three parts support the other. And together, they establish a shared and explicit value for what is desirable, achievable, and measurable. So let's look at each one of these. Stakeholder value, or public value, as it is established here, is really what is the important value that the library produces. 
it could be the library as a whole, or it could be a particular strategic intention of the library. And I'm going to share an example to, uh, with you in a minute, which is really about a strategic intention. The other thing that it does is it, it focuses on the sources of legitimacy and support that are necessary to authorize the library to take action. And it makes sure that with that legitimacy, the resources that are needed to sustain it are also available. The importance here is you begin to get uh, sort of a reality check on how far your you can deliver on a value. What are the constraints and what are the opportunities that exist for you? The third piece of this is more inward looking on the library itself, which is really what are the new investments, innovations, and alliances that the library is going to need to rely on in order to deliver the results. So these three things, stakeholder value, legitimacy, <laughs> legitimacy and support, and operational capabilities are all needed in order for you to check off that first component, the values. Let's take a look at an example. So here we are. Um, earlier, I'd say, you know, a while ago, really, um, open access came to light, and the Harvard Library was very committed to um, to um, facilitating an initiative across the university. This strategic intention of open access was really clearly conceptually appealing um, to ensure scholarship was available broadly to the world, that the faculty could engage with its, you know, faculty everywhere, that, that we really opened up our assets to knowledge creation. So the, conceptually, there wasn't any question about value. But through a series of conversations, both internally with faculty members and externally with um, individuals and in other institutions, it was clear that there wasn't a shared understanding of that value. Um, and in fact, there was quite a knowledge gap of what was possible, you know, what, what could open access deliver and not deliver. So through the scholarly communications office, um, the, and in partnership with Harvard thought leaders, such as Peter Zuber and Stuart Schieber, we came up with uh, two really important um, benefits that would show uh, the value that would be delivered um, and answer some of the questions about value that were being expressed to us. First was, how could we make it easier for faculty? And this came down to financial support, and not just financial support, but process support. So there was, so they weren't sure how it worked out financially, who would pay for what, and they weren't sure, and they were pretty clear that they didn't have the time to really uh, apply all these processes. So we put, you know, we had to walk through value in terms of achievability. There was also a real need to be able to demonstrate something. So the quick fix, the, the low hanging fruit, something that they could say, okay, I, 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 get, I get it now. And so we actually moved to open ac access to all our metadata, which um, many of you may not be aware of, but some of you might. And that was really a big, a big deal and, and took work, but it wasn't an insurmountable problem. It was really something realistic that we could get done. Furthermore, uh, the team worked with publishers, copyright scholars, our academic leadership, um, so academic deans, and, and just the fundamental, the repository managers to make it easier for people to use and find what they needed to make open access compatible um, uh, with the tenure process uh, where it was adopted and to continue to work on economic affordability. In fact, we ended up engaging faculty in that. So the more they saw a role and the benefit, the more shared value they perceived there to be for them. It was obvious uh, that unless the influencers within the university bought into open access, uh, 
that we couldn't get much traction. And thankfully, we were able to make the case because the faculty themselves made it. The librarians definitely influenced it, but through the faculty body, they made the case. It was not a unanimous agreement, and we had to work hard to, to, to lead up to that discussion. But the more faculty understood the need for it and understood the context of scholarly publishing, the more substantive the conversation became. And their active engagement legitimized this important issue. Equally important was that the influencers were hearing about the issues in their own forums as well. So our role in participating and, and enabling um, peer discussions among provosts, presidents, and scholarly societies was frankly where they, they began, I think, to, to recognize as something that we had to address. Lastly, it's no easy thing to put in these uh, changes. And uh, significant time really had to go into policy development um, significant um, buy-in by partners within the university, such as our intellectual property lawyer, um, work with the deans um, on processes and their administrative offices on processes to secure um, a place for peer-reviewed open access journals in their tenure processes, library expertise to help with author rights and repository management, um, all of these were really important operational capabilities that had to be put in place as well. So the result was yes. I mean, there, there is significant commitment to open access at Harvard. Um, it took us to build value through achievability as well as desirability. We did make progress. It hasn't been solved. Recently, I co-chaired a working group at the Social Science Research Council on social science knowledge curation under digital conditions. And many of these topics on OA remain live topics among librarians, publishers, academic leaders, scholars, and students. I also recently spoke with Peter Zuber, who was sort of a, a, a really pioneer in this field. And he told me that we're still facing the same issues today, that we just have to address them slightly differently. And while progress has been made, there is much to do. So I think the point here is that it takes uh, it takes looking at value on through three core components: stakeholder value, reaching an understanding of what that explicit shared value is, the ability to uh, have legitimacy and the support, understanding what you're dealing with in terms of that. And the third thing is to be able to understand what you're capable of actually implementing to show progress. So that's the first component. Is there any uh, burning question now? Otherwise, I'll move on to the next to the next slide. Okay. Let's go on to the next key component then. Let's that better? Oh, Mary Lee, there is one question. Oh, uh, I'm Jin sorry. Guo asked. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Can you see the question? Oh, I did not. Does he, can I read it out loud? Oh, everybody can see it, right? Um, does open access help the library negotiate contract with publishers? That's a great question. So, um, in my in my experience. Um, it depends. I mean, there are many publishers that do have open access dimensions to their licenses, right? So not, you know, they're not all black and white. They're either open access or they're not. So I think it really depends on the publisher you're dealing with. What has changed, uh, or at least I've seen change, is that because faculty members have a better understanding, and we work really hard on this, about what their rights are, and they really have the uh, relationship with publishers. They've been able to put pressure on publishers to um, make their information available, in um, even if it's with a six month um, within a six month publishing period, they make it all available for free. But I think the the key here in terms of licensing has been 
having the faculty understand that they are honestly the key contributors and editors of almost all these, pub, um, um, they have rights. So that's the way we address that. Does that help? Okay, thanks, Kim. I see that, are you typing, Stephen? Just wanna make sure I'm waiting. Ray, do you think I should go ahead? Um, that's a good question. He's still typing, so oh, I guess he stopped. Um, maybe maybe he'll, he'll come back at the end. But please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Ray. Okay, thanks. I'd like to talk about the second really important component, which is setting a strategic direction. Um, once you understand the shared explicit value. Uh, you really need to um, articulate this in a way that is reflects um, a compelling narrative that reflects what it is that you're all interested in achieving, uh, including the related core activities, not every activity because there could be millions of tasks, but we're talking about the major activities that will lead to those achievements and associated measures of success. Um, Hi, Mary Lee, sorry. Um, there was a comment about your voice um, becoming faint again. Can you just okay, speak sorry. up a little? Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Anna, here you go. Yeah, is that better? Yeah, my apologies. Okay. The process of setting a strategic direction is best described as a series of decisions that engage the stakeholders and their knowledge. Knowing, be, knowing that something matters, which is really a conversation, and also knowing how it, to get it done, it, it, it is something we depend on each other for. It needs to be based on evidence, assessment, and yes, intuition, and through a series of discussions that require leadership, management, and calculated risk taking. And I'll come back to the this dual role of leadership and management at the end of the presentation. There are several potential frameworks that you can employ to build a strategic direction. I'm going to review some of them here and I'm not gonna spend ages on it, but I, I wanted to leave you with them. Um, so, because the work of setting a strategic direction takes time. And it isn't created in a room with just a few select people, at least not in today's world. Um, each of these frameworks helps you think about how you might want to best proceed with your work. Uh, and there is no best solution. You need to think about what will work in your setting. Okay. Uh, so just to remind you that it's a compelling narrative, you end up with a compelling narrative. You have a set of target achievements, related activities, and uh, indicators that uh, can measure your success. So let's talk about the frameworks a little bit. I'm sharing several here with you today. Uh, there's another one that I want to bring to your attention that I've also used several times um, that you may be more familiar with, which is the theory of change. Uh, there's a lot on all of these topics. These other ones you may not be as familiar with, and so that's why I'm bringing them to your attention. I'm going to briefly uh, summarize this for you, uh, but there's a lot of information on each one of these uh, in the literature. So I hope this is either a, a good introduction or a helpful refresher. So the first thing I want to talk to you about are some foundational, like really foundational um, uh, frameworks. The Art of the Long View was published in 1991. Um, it's really a seminal work on scenario planning and Peter Schwartz has gone on to do m many other types of um, strategic work. But I think the key 
uh, takeaway from this is that it really provides the basis for analytical predicting um, by uh, looking at potential end states, not just one, but, but, uh, but a variety of them, and, and really designing the path toward the desired future. Not you know, step by step, but what are the key markers? And what was important about this was that it really pulled from a multiple sources of information. So it wasn't just like, you know, at the customer feedback loop, it also include market research, it included um, the experience of the stakeholders themselves, it included, you know, research um, that was done by um, in academia. So I think it's really important to think of that as uh, a foundational source uh, as you work on your strategy. The other source that's foundational that I want to bring to your attention that you may or may not be as familiar with is uh, future mapping. What was really interesting about this and important was it, it engaged large numbers of stakeholders. And I mean like faculty, students, uh, you know, staff, just it really engaged large groups of stakeholders working together through consensus, um, what, we, what we really called wisdom of the crowd, to reach agreement on a possible desired and probable end state that everyone could buy into. Um, the important thing about this future mapping process as well was that uh, it sort of prioritized what were the key events that have to occur um, for this particular end state to, to be um, realized. And so people who were managing the strategy at the time or people who were working on the strategy or living the strategy were, were attuned to what they had to look for in the environment that would either need to trigger a directional change in an end state or maybe even like throwing out the end state altogether. So um, I think that's an important concept to remember. You're probably all very familiar with Porter's Five Forces. And I think in our case as a, um, information and knowledge creation based organization. Uh, it's really important to think about this because it's really, it focuses on a framework for accessing the competitive forces within a whole industry. And we are in an industry, even if it's not a word that we use um, a lot, um, it, we are part of this broader industry of information and knowledge creation. And what this uh, tool does, framework does, it highlights the dynamic nature of our environment. It covers the threat of substitute products or services, the bargaining power of suppliers. We just talked about publishers. That's part of what we have to think about. The bargaining power of buyers. How do we actually influence and how are others influencing them? The threat of new entrants. And in the midst of all of this, rivalry among existing competitors. And so I think it helps to open up our, our, our understanding of our industry. More importantly, more recently, excuse me, there are some, a couple of other interesting approaches, particularly as we begin to think of strategy as closely tied to innovation. Um, and really strategy is about innovation. So how do we think about driving innovation adoption? How do we share the risks and the benefits with others because so much of what we need to do, we can't possibly do on our own. So John C. Lee Brown wrote a, some interesting work on um, strategy shaping. And really this is, uh, this really looks at how uh, organizations and partners to get together to think about how they can work together to um, create new uh, practices and new opportunities. The framework I'm going to spend a little more time with you on today is uh, called uh, strategic conversations. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I think that in our day, uh, there's so much um, of what we do that needs to be cognizant to engage uh, our social and peer networks. We have to think a lot about the speed at which technology is disrupting in any part of an organization and an, in, an institution and an industry and the broader world. And this highly dynamic environment really means we have to uh, be very agile.
So at the end of the day, though, what does it all come down to? Well, it does come down to an explicit expression of the strategic direction that everyone can use. And um, in this case, I'm sharing the British Library's 2020 vision because honestly, I really like it. Um, but I think what's really key, the key takeaway about this is it can be very short. You know, it can be a page or two and you can still know where you're heading and it can be longer where you need to outline um, the particular activities and the, and the measurements that you're going to use. Um, it really depends on your stakeholder audience. Uh, and so I think it's really important for you to look at other strategies and there's lots out there. Uh, but I think the key takeaway about this one is just how straightforward it is. It's both aspirational, it's clear what they want to do. And if in the, in the longer document, it's actually extremely concise about what the deliverables are and how they'll know those deliverables when they've achieved them. All right, so how do you really get to that document? Because that takes a lot of time. Well, at this point in the process, it's almost totally dependent on leadership. And note that I'm not saying a leader, although clearly a leader of leaders is important, but leadership is a shared responsibility in strategy development. And it takes many leaders to make it happen. A leader of leaders is needed, yes, but leaders are needed throughout all the stakeholder groups. Leaders take on the responsibility to identify the opportunities to recognize and understand how to best minimize the constraints which always exist, such as budgets, physical space, hiring policies, and to calculate the risks, costs, benefits to relationships, to efficiencies, that is figuring out what it will take to deliver on the vision. So leadership, curiosity, and conversations are really the art, science, and the discipline that lead to the strategic direction. But it begins with conversation. I use this uh, process knowingly and unknowingly <laughs> uh, pretty much throughout my career. Uh, so I want to uh, share this data with you because I think it will be very helpful to you. Um, this is based on a book and a work that was written by J.C. Spender and Bruce Strong on strategic conversations. There are many people talking about strategic conversations and strategy emergence through full stakeholder engagement. So you can find your own, but I think the important point here is that it's important to uh, execute a strategy in an inclusive way. Um, it's, it's extremely important because this is the way that you ensure your strategy is meaningful, which will ensure that wherever anyone interacts with your organization, it will also be visible. So under the top-down model, management can either be um, and either be, make a good decision, but in doing so, they disenfranchise employees, and many of us have seen this. Or they can make a poor decision, and this happens too, and employees are not only disenfranchised, but they're cynical about management's ability. Either way, it leads to an unsuccessful strategy. So um, the 80%, so the 80% of, or I think it was 79% that McKinsey found could be successful, really uh, engaged in uh, conversations. And um, this not only makes the conception and execution of strategy better, it makes it faster and it makes it more efficient. This is precisely what we use in the context of our innovation communities at the New York Public Library. And although we didn't follow this, you know, Step by step, when we built the strategy to begin with, we did engage over 500 members of staff, board members, and patrons in establishing the strategic direction. So conceptually, it was this idea of broad stakeholder 
engagement. And so what I want to do is be able to show you um, uh, some work that we did with that. So um, conversations then are not top down and they're not bottom up. Okay. So it isn't like um, there's a lot, there's, there's this one end of the spectrum doing the work, telling people what to do. In fact, these two supposedly polar opposites um, end up being uh, integrated and they share a common situation, which is that the lack of conversation between them leads to really empty results. And without that conversation, the very in essence of employee intrinsic motivation is lost. The, um, it's very important that conversations provide the space for employees to be able to master their career, to have autonomy to make a difference, to have a sense of purpose and belonging. Um, and uh, laissez-faire is great, except that senior management doesn't really know what's being done um, and uh, probably isn't providing the expertise that they might have to offer. And worst case scenario, they actually cut off the budgets. Uh, with command and control, the mastery is totally diminished and people feel uh, completely disconnected to the strategic direction. So the conversations are in that sweet spot. Let me let me share my uh, New York Public Library example, but I also want to tell you that if you want to learn more about it, please uh, go to a Harvard Business Review online and you can find our article uh, there. Thank you. Oh, Mary Lee, there is a comment by Stephen. Yes, Stephen. Yes, Stephen. He says here, the challenge we find is getting library staff that are more focused on day-to-day -day operational and tactical activity to engage in a strategic conversation about vision, future, strategic di direction, etc. It does not help that many colleagues are not engaged by business-oriented matters. So how do we turn in, into a conversation that is less strategic and more, how do we make this a better library for the community? Stephen, perfect timing because I'm about to talk to you about innovation communities and this is how we did it. Are you prepared? Can we go through that slide? And if I haven't answered your question then, um, please uh, make another note. So this was precisely the problem we were facing at the New York Public Library. We spent uh, almost seven months with 500 people really working in rooms um, uh, to put together our strategic direction, which came down to some very simple language, just like the British Library. But when we started to implement it, uh, you know, there's 2,000 people and 2,400 people in the organization. The vast majority of the organization really did not feel very connected to it in terms of like, okay, Every day when I go to work, this is not like I don't feel it. So I brought in Bruce Strong and we worked on innovation communities that were based on those achievements. So if we wanted to increase access to information for students in, in middle school, partnering with schools because these kids were in high need neighborhoods and they didn't have access and we had a really important role to play, that was the aspiration. But how did we empower 88 libraries to do that? So this is how we did it. Um, and we have 15 minutes, so I'm very happy to spend more time on this if this is where we want to spend it. Um, we set up, uh, we basically put a call out to the entire library staff to participate on uh, what we call the innovation communities to help them, and these were not, you know, you're not, you know, executives, to help all the people that were facing part of the process or part of circulation or part of reference or part of book collection development, to bring them in and say, how are we going to get more books used by kids in these middle schools 
to help them get better grades in their classes. Um, and another thing that was, was how are we going to, uh, one of the concerns by the staff was that this all sounded great, but they didn't actually uh, feel like we had uh, an easy way uh, for doing, you know, a good reference model for the library anymore. And so these innovation communities were very tactically based, but they pushed the strategy forward. The teams were based, there were three core teams in our case. And so the core teams didn't do all the work themselves. They, there were specific roles. They volunteered to be leaders. They had to have a certain amount of expertise and they were given the time and the space and the recognition for taking their role on. So it wasn't extra work. We provided them with um, people who were experts in analytics and project management and um, uh, focus groups, et cetera, so that they didn't have to become an expert in anything, but their team was gonna help them drive towards changes in the way they did their work that showed a visible difference in their very specific local community. Um, I have to say that the results were, are published in the Harvard Business Review and we ha they did see really important change and perhaps even the most important change because it takes time. You know, we did do good work in the six to one year that we did this work, but over time is where you're really going to see the difference. Um, but these staff members became very, very connected to the strategy and therefore felt empowered to change things in their own daily lives, as well as to bring it to the attention of a cross-disciplinary group of people rather than feeling completely disempowered. Um, on the leadership side, what we set in place was uh, A, a physical space where everybody could go to do the work we set aside a day a week so they knew they didn't have to do any other kind of work. This was the work they were going to do because they knew it was going to benefit every day of their life in the library. And, and we gave, and we rewarded and recognized them. They were allowed to, they presented all their work to the, the entire library. They received, um, you know, kudos from the president. They were, they learned new skills, which they also felt like they were getting professional development. Um, we really broke down barriers. The other thing we did is because not everybody could participate on a core team is people became testers. So people who wanted to try out these ideas in different library locations volunteered to be testers. And so they felt very committed because they were trying things out in their own communities. And then there were other people who may have not been as attached to the particular um, uh, event or the particular um, uh, operation, but they had a, they had knowledge or they simply had an opinion of what mattered, and these people became the conversationalists. And this way, for these three innovation communities, we had active, and I mean active engagement, not just once or twice, active engagement by about 200 people across the library focused on these very specific issues. Um, I can tell you that the library is continuing to use in innovation communities, and so it, it did take hold. So you have to drill down and you have to have the conversations not about the strategy alone, but the how you're going to make it happen. And that's what's done with the people who actually do the work. I hope that answers your question, Sue. Okay, great. So let's go on. Um, I'd like to go on to the next thing, which is really getting to the core of it. Um, sorry. Depending how, uh, yeah, operational, sorry, alignment and commitment. Remember I said to you earlier that uh, leadership and management is something that we do it isn't that we do them in a serial, you know, in a serial way. We're not a leader and then four months later we're a manager or, 
you know, we're a leader and we do, we do leadership things and management things all the time. And so we, when we look at strategy, we can't think of it just as leadership. We also have to think about it as management. And the reason it will be successful is because it's going to be sustained. And that's all about alignment and commitment. So uh, I think it's very important, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on project management because there's so many other people who will do that. But it's really important that I, I want to talk to you about this leadership management duo, is what I call it. And um, I want to manage your expectations that it really does take about three to five years, in my experience, to see the significant change you want to see, but you're going to see way more change in that three years than you possibly could see if you didn't drill and have these conversations and empower the people who do this work with the skills and the support they need to make good decisions. So the key takeaway from this section is really that alignment and commitment requires us to fluctuate between leadership and management when needed. So let's get to the core to it. Let's just talk about these two things, commitment and alignment. How do we know it? Well, commitment really is the state or quality of being dedicated. And I, and I emphasize the word dedicated to a cause and activity, in, even when it's just not looking that great. It's then dedicated to understanding what's happening. We can, we're all like little sensors and there's no way that, you know, if you're in a senior role that you're going to know what's happening on the front desk. And if you're on the front desk, that you're going to know what the senior manager is trying to do. So it's very important to create this common commitment and also a sense of what you can do about it. When people experience commitment, we see that there is recognition, clarity, validation, resources are put in place, and most importantly, trust. Um, we could talk a whole seminar, webinar on trust, but th those are the key things about commitment. In terms of alignment, when people, alignment is really both a position of agreement and alliance. So I agree with you and I'm lining up with it. And an arrangement in appropriate relative positions, meaning I know how to move when the environment changes. When people are aligned, they are creating and adjusting their own work to achieve the strategic direction. There are regular and as needed situational conversations. In the approach I talked to you about conversations, there were fixed meeting times and there was always access to decisions as well as clarity about who was responsible for making the decision. So really, really um, having a network of decision making rather than just up and down a, a hierarchy. And that's possible because everyone knows what they need to do and how what they're doing is going to affect the outcome. So it is really this building commitment and sustaining alignment and commitment that we most see the need for leadership and management. Yes, they're distinctive and they're each requires different skills and competencies, but we really have to be capable of both. And in the roles that you are playing, you really do. Um, so uh, here are you know the responsibilities of these uh, leaders and managers. I'm not going to read this out for you because I think you can see it, but you'll see that I also conclude with it's really important to celebrate. Um, at, you know, I, I, this is something I really learned at Microsoft was how powerful a thank you is, how powerful uh, an event of, you know, it doesn't have to be an expensive event is. It's just the, as you accomplish things as a team in your strategy, it's so important to recognize everyone for what they're doing. So I have a few minutes and I don't want to leave without a couple of minutes for questions at least. And so look, meaningful impact is only possible when it's crafted with the stakeholders. And I mean students, faculty, you know, the whole shebang. Um, if you want to 
to make it sustainable, you're going to have to be a leader and a manager. And um, it's really going to depend on you paying very careful attention to value up front, to bringing everybody in in the strategic direction setting, to, uh, to working with a team of leadership, so leaders everywhere, managers everywhere. Um, every single individual has the capacity to be a good leader and a good manager. And through this, you can uh, create a meaningful uh, difference. And if you're creating a meaningful difference, I promise you it will be a visible one. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lee. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to raise. I know there was one question about um, getting a copy of your slides. Would you make them available at SlideShare or? Oh absolutely. Um, oh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, great. So I can get that from you and share it with everyone later. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. You're very welcome to all of you, and and I really appreciate you having the opportunity to talk to you and do the very best with you. Yeah, if there are no other questions, uh, just um, feel free. I just want to mention that uh, we will be having another webinar by Je uh, Jessica Clemens from University at Buffalo. She's the associate university librarian there to talk about being bold through change. It'll be sometime late October, so stay tuned for that. But if there are no other questions or comments, uh, you're welcome to leave. And uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you, Mary Lee. And hopefully this will help everyone and inspire them to take on a leadership role in strategic planning. Thank you. Bye-bye.